boom, boom, they had a three-hour session. You had to record the voiceover, and you had to do the, the put in the music and the effects and, the, and mix it and edit it and all of that. And you got so fast. You know, I got to where you could add S's and dot I's. You know, pew, pew. And, yeah. I bet. <laughs> That's some pretty good training. Did you make those sounds? Because I would appreciate that. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I, I've done a lot of sound effects so. <laughs> for cartoons. So, yeah. Oinks, doinks, and doinks. So that was your... Okay, so Allie, what was your path to stardom? Stardom. <laughs> well, um, okay. I'll give you the, I'll give you the, the shortest version possible. Um, so I was going to college to be a journalist, um, and I still to this day can't spell for shit. So I don't really know how to use a semicolon correctly uh, or anything. And that's a really big problem in journalism, you know? Uh, so, so I was just like failing everything, and I, I wrote this paper, and I thought like I did like so good on it, and I got it back, and I failed it too, and I was just like, screw this. So immediately after that class, I just went and I dropped out of college without telling anybody. And uh, <laughs> like three days after the day, you could get any money back for it too. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were like, no, we don't care. We're going to keep all that money. Um, and but so I, I was just going to community college. I went, got my car to go home, and I was like, man, I just dropped out of college. So I didn't have to have a plan to tell my parents when I get home. And I was like, uh, at one time when I was like 15, I wanted to make beats, so I should just, I'll just go look that up. So I went in the library and I looked it up and engineering schools came up and I went home and I told my parents that uh, that's what I was gonna do. And they were like, what? And I was like, yeah. And they were like, all right, cool. You could do whatever you want, but we're just not gonna, we're just not gonna help you at all. And I was like, sweet, cool. Uh, so I moved to Baltimore by myself, and I went to, uh, yeah, I did, I made a, honestly, like, I was 19, and I'm real lucky I'm alive still, because uh, I didn't know anything about life, and I was living in Baltimore, Maryland. <laughs> um, you know, we could, we could talk about that some other times, crazy shit. Um, but I just went to a six-month course, because I just kind of wanted to get to it, but I didn't know anything about engineering. So it really just kind of taught me the language and sort of how to plug things in. Um, and then I just, I went back, I went back home and I, um, I moved to South, South Philly and I just kind of, you know, pretended that I was an engineer uh, until I was one. Um, but, okay, hold on, I'm skipping. How over, did like, you, how, so what did, what did that actually mean? You show, you were showing up to studios or something? And, yeah, you know, I, and honestly, just, like, three days after I moved to Philly, I went to the studio, and this guy gave me a job, and I'm sure he regrets that. <laughs> uh, actually, he doesn't regret it, because every time I do something cool, he's always like, yeah, you know, I taught Allie everything I know, and look how she was an intern at our studio. I'm like, I wasn't an intern. I was an engineer, man. Like, you did not train me, but he did kind of train me. <laughs> anyway, sorry, off topic. No, um, it's not off topic. It's, it's well, on yeah, topic right. But yeah, no, I just, I really did. I just went to the studios. I went anywhere that, you know, anybody who knew anything about the music business was going to be like, that's all you can do. If you don't know how to get into it, you just have to be around people who are in it. Um, and then follow them. Um, but so, so I was, you know, out here pretending to be an engineer. I was like tacking sheets up in my ceiling and stuff. And, uh, and then I ran out of all my money. Wait a minute. You were, you were, you were doing what? Ta tacking, tacking sheets to my ceiling for the booth? Treatment. Yeah. <laughs> you know that, that, that one centimeter Apparently really. Apparently none of you understand what a moderator <laughs> does. I've, I've used that before. Yeah, no, no. It, 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 no, it, it no, great. It, it was it was fine. I mean, I wasn't any good, so it didn't matter. <laughs> I had posters. I had a lot of posters with resistor color code, and um, like so. Before I would go to bed, I would I would be like, "I'm gonna learn you. I'm gonna learn you. I'm gonna learn you." You know. <laughs> cool story, bro. <laughs> Like with your tacking of your sheets, I relate in my own way. I had my posters. All right, I'm gonna go back to stoic moderator. Love you, Doug. I love you too. Um, yeah, so I was just doing that, and then yeah, I ran out of all my money, um, and you know, my parents basically told me I was gonna fail, so I had to kind of prove them wrong. But I got a job at Jimmy John's, and I went for one day. 
And I was like, nah, yo. <laughs> I'm so good at telling stories. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, and yeah, so I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to figure out how to make this happen. And I went on Craigslist, and there was a venue that was like, we're opening the upstairs. Uh, and basically, we'll take anyone who will accept $60 a night to do live sound. And I was like, cool. I don't know really how to do that. But I live 10 minute walk away and I'll always show up. And they were like, cool. And I got really fortunate because uh, they let me mess up. You know, I'll never forget the first night I mic'd an acoustic guitar with an SM58. And <laughs> right, yeah, you already know yeah. what happened. And that guy felt so bad for me at the end of the night, he gave me 20 bucks. <laughs> He was like, really, really sorry that my pickup failed. I was like, yeah, man, that sucked. <laughs> um, you know, but I, but I worked there for five years um, and did a lot of genres of music, and that led to, to a lot of touring. Uh, yeah, every, every genre. I mic'd up, like, everything. You, like, in live sound, people, like, the guy brought, like, the pre-piano one time, and he's like, yeah, I just got these mallets, and I hit the strings. It's like the piano. And I was like, oh, it's, it's called something. Um, but yeah, so so I did that, and that led to, and I worked all over Philly and and toured and stuff, and I eventually uh, got the gig to be front of house uh, for Fetty Wap and Post Malone, um, and that was the greatest experience of my life, and it changed my life from, you know, dreaming about doing this to really doing it, um, and everything being goals at that point, uh, and that's where I met my current mentor right now. Uh, she wrote Empire State of Mind for Jay Z and Alicia Keys. Um, she took me to the other side of the world and sat me down in a cafe and said, Ali, if you really want to do this, you got to move to LA. So I was like, cool, when we get back to America, I'll do that. Um, and yeah, then I moved out here and, and I remember when I got here, everyone was like, so what are you going to do? What kind of regular job are you going to get? And I was like, I want to be an audio engineer, man. I've been being an audio engineer. Why would I do anything else? Um, and here I am. <laughs> Did I do okay? Okay. Jet's story is better than mine. Emac, the, the immaculate apparel. Uh, Come I on. Mean, okay, so I recently started a clothing line. Woo! This is my t shirt, immaculate apparel. Um, that's A M A C U L E N T. Um, and actually, it's for. Do I have time to like go in, go into this a little bit? This thing is three hours. Go. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. Cool. So I always wore AMAC beanies and uh, and people wanted them and I just ended up going into this immaculate apparel thing and and making these designs. Um, but what it's really about for me uh, is kind of being able to get in, into the out into the community. Now I'm getting really nervous. It's okay. Um, and I'm going to fuse the music with the clothing line um, by starting an event at Coven House LA. I don't know if any of you guys know what that is. Um, it's, a homeless, it's a homeless shelter for 18 and 24 year olds. Uh, yeah, did I say that wrong? Well, OK. See, I can't spell, I can't speak. That's a thing. <laughs> uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start. Um, I, I don't want to call it a writing camp, but writing sessions uh, with the youth there. Um, so, you know, honestly, if, if anybody's interested, please speak to me at the end of the night because I need songwriters, I need engineers, and I need producers. Uh, and we're going to, you know, go in and, and, and help these kids write songs about their life and uh, just as kind of a therapeutic thing and give them a real... I, and I'm going to finish, you know, I'm going to mix it, I'm going to master it, and they're going to have a real thing that they can play for people, and then I'm going to hook them up with, with my clothes. Um, and, it, and the whole brand, like this shirt says, get back up. It's all just about, it. I mean, it's really me, but it's like entrepreneurship. And everything you guys are trying to do in this room, like there's going to be so many ups and downs. Like you're going to get crushed. Like that's real. Um, but as long as you wake up the next day and you do it again, like you're going to be all right. And now please jet talk. Hello. Okay. So, um, one thing that that like um, hit me hard, like in all these storytelling, is the concept of epiphany, because it happened to me too. Um, 
I, I was a middle child that just did not know really what to, um, what I wanted to do growing up. But I was raised in a musical family. My parents um, named me Joan Jett for a reason. Um, they manage rock bands. That's that's our family's bread and butter. But um, I grew up just loving music. I hear music um, in our house. Um, we have a rehearsal room for bands, just jamming out music every day. But I, I, ha I come from a classical music background, surprisingly. I'm a classical soprano. Um, so I, um, before um, getting into this career, I actually have a degree in psychology. So I'm like, like psyching you guys out right now. Um, but um, while I was doing psychology, I was also part of a um, choral group. Um, we are a professional choir that toured all over. So um, this I bet was you the psych the psych degree comes in real handy sometimes with what? different uh, artists. Yeah, seriously, it's like in in a recording studio, it's like you're you're kind of like the bartender. You end up like listening to to a lot of things that are not supposed to come out, but just because of like the recording session is such a um, it's you, you, the musicians like really pour their heart out into their music, so they become vulnerable so a lot of things are get shared but um that's why it's like a recording studio is, is a sacred place in a way so being a psychologist when i was starting out kind of helped um just uh not that i'm like analyzing people in a session but it just helped me like understand the whole like keeping that psyche. sacred that that vibe, whatever yeah. you want to call it, yeah. that place where an artist can be vulnerable and yeah. share and yeah. creative so without fear. lay down fear. on this couch, tell me your problems. Okay. Whatever it is, yeah. <laughs> but, um, so I was part of a choir, um, and when I was studying psychology, because I've, I've always also like, uh, besides music, I love technology, I built computers, um, we were like, um, I didn't have brothers, but my dad was like very supportive of like teaching me how to like build computers and, and just work with electronics and stuff. So I really love technology and also music. Just didn't know how to like bridge those two because in the Philippines there's no music engineering school. Um, and there's no like, uh, I guess there's, there's programs that exist today, but during my time there's really nothing in there. So I didn't know how to, how to bridge the two. But when I traveled here in the US with my choir, I discovered um, but there's a thing called audio engineering, and that's when everything just freaking clicked. Like, um, that's when things just became laser focused for me. Um, but because in the Philippines, there's really no um, audio engineering school, I, I had to um, come here to the States. So um, while getting ready with like finding the right school, um, making sure that I actually know at least a bit about the whole um, concept of audio engineering, um, I actually, um, found I, I wanted to be exposed to technology as much as I could. It's the least that I could do while I'm still in the Philippines. So luckily in my university, there's a media communications foundation that helped um, teach any kind of, of media, like um, web development, video production, um, graphics design to priests and, and nuns. So that was my gig um, when I graduated. Wow. But um, because it's a media communications foundation, they also had a recording studio, and they um, that um, they were actually known all over the Philippines for high quality praise music. And um, I did not know that that facility had a recording studio, but when I was being interviewed for my job to teach web design and graphics design, video editing to priests, I told the director that I'm getting ready to pursue audio engineering. In, in the US. So that's when he mentioned, hey, there's a, we have a recording studio and we're actually looking for interns. That was the weirdest like coincidence. Um, but, <laughs> um, however, um, so I was also, uh, there also came a point where I was really lucky because my name is Jet, I go by Jet. And I, um, I was able to get that internship Oh, well, it's not internship, it's like apprenticeship in that recording studio because the senior sound engineer didn't know I was a girl. And they only found out, he only found out a day before the whole apprenticeship program was going to start that the person you're teaching was a girl and it was too late for him to say no. So um, it it's like adding fuel to the fire of me just proving that I'm, I'm actually um, here 
and I'm serious. So for over six months, I had my day job teaching priests during the day. And then I would work um, 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. just um, recording. Um, and I was very fortunate for that. So I ended up being a full-time recording engineer in that recording studio in the Philippines. And I worked there for four years, um, uh, recording, mixing, and mastering. And was very fortunate that my mentor like taught me the proper way of mastering, which is like relying on WaveLab as a mastering DAW. Um, but at that point, then I went to Berkeley College of Music to study music production engineering. And at that point, I was already 24. And the good thing about that, even if you're starting late, you actually know that you want this. So, um, so in a way, don't be discouraged when you're just feeling that, oh, I want to be in sound or in audio and, and I'm like 40 years old. Because like, when you get into that, you actually know what you want, rather than an 18 year old who just like got into it and like, I don't know what to do. So, I mean, um, things are different for everyone, but just saying like, um, don't be disheartened. So yeah, that's how I got into um, audio engineering. Um, but to be a mass, um, as a mastering engineer, um, that wasn't like, very straightforward. It wasn't linear for me. When I graduated in Berkeley College of Music, um, I actually wanted to be a scoring engineer. Um, I think you wanted to be, you were saying you wanted to get into scoring. It was a, fa it was a fantasy dream of mine. <laughs> well, I <laughs> thought. Maybe one day. Maybe. I'll try that, but I have, I, I'm like focused on that. I thing. mean, dude, you're like, what you do is cool right now. It's like, super cool. Yeah. I like what I'm doing. Exactly. <laughs> Um, so when I was graduating, I, I was um, when you're in school, you dabble into all of these things. And um, what I always try to tell people who are still in audio engineering school is, don't worry. Um, I did a lot of free um, just recording sessions. I volunteered everywhere, and I, I got flack from my from other students because I did everything free. But, well, I can't also charge because I was an international student. But then I still didn't. Uh, in, um, you can't work uh, if you're an international student. But um, I don't even take, like, cash or something. Because for me, the portfolio and the credits were more important. And so that's, that's where I focused. And so I was um, building my skills in all these fields. But I also had this fantasy that I wanted to be a scoring engineer because, like, just the idea of recording a Star Wars soundtrack is freaking cool. But um, I almost got into that um, line of work because there was, I got um, hired, um, when I was still in school, there was a job waiting for me. I got chosen to become the recording engineer for the Aspen Music Festival, which is like a pretty cool um, classical recording festival in Aspen, Colorado. But my employment authorization card didn't make it on time. It was like, it arrived in the mail just two days late. So like, I had that whole three months blocked just for that um, job. But then like, yeah, it, it really sucked because as an international student, you only had one year of like really working like legit legitimately um, in your field. So three months, like, suddenly opened, so I um, sought out help um, in the school, and I just kept sending out leads. Uh, I ended up uh, getting the opportunity to intern at Avatar Studios in New York, now known as Power Station. So... Well, that's a, that's a nice silver lining. Yeah, <laughs> yeah um, like, uh, it wasn't easy, but it's like I had to... Um, it's good that I had a background in graphics design because I really just pimped the hell out of that resume. Just made it, made it That's like... That's how you got in there. You made it look good. I made it look good. I made it colorful and all that, but um, I didn't hear back from them the first time. I resent it after two weeks, but I always made sure that I, I dropped, the, the, I name dropped the, the head of the auto engineering department in Berkeley because hey, blah, 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 um, recommended me, like, told me to reach out to you for the internship. Um, like, any chance that you could, like, rely on your contacts to, like, get an in, and then also have a good resume. That helps. And also back it up with, like, legit portfolio. So Stuff you've actually worked on. Yes. Um, but, yeah, so I got the three-month internship in, in Avatar Studios, which was really cool. But 
they also, the good thing about that internship is, although it was free back in the day. Can like, we back up to stuff yeah. we've actually worked on for a second? Oh, sure. Because in terms of credits, you know, would you, would you put on your resume, your resume, your CV, your portfolio, whatever you want to call it, would you put something that you assisted for and say just ran errands and was a runner for and made coffee on? Did you... Do you get a credit on that? Well, in Avatar, um, Paul McCartney was tracking his new album at that time. Esperanto Spalding was there, Bobby McFerrin. I didn't really put my na- put their names on my resume. Like, f- for me, I wasn't in that session. I was just um, doing I was doing coffee runs. It was cool when when Esperanto Spalding said, "Call me SP." <laughs> all right. Yeah, and and I, I had like all those cool anecdotes of my experience, but. Um, what I got out of that internship was um, I got noticed by one of the in-house producers in Avatar Studios. Um, I want to back up to that point because yes. I think it's important to know at what point you can claim credit for mm, yeah. a project that you've worked on on your resume or your portfolio or your website or when you're talking to people. And so I'm not sure what that well, distinction is. For me, you would have to have actually worked I think on it. If you've assisted, if you've assist- like assisted a session, mm-hmm. By all means, you're. I think for me personally, um, and even if if eventually I end up like leading a session and, and I have a- assistant engineers, I um, I understand the value of the credit. So um, even if you've assisted, like a, moved some audio clips, like you actually held the DAW, um, then that's your credit. T- claim that credit. Um, and even if you're not on the on the liner notes, freaking put it on your website, um, and because it's it's um, yours to to benefit from because you really was you, you were part of that session. So thank you I, for making that point. Again, that's where the metadata is so important. Yeah, and make sure that uh, if you were the assistant on there, that your name is included in the metadata when they submit it. Yeah. Oh, um, okay, so... Because that's how you get gigs. Yeah, credits are such a... It's a currency in, in this business. And they have to mm-hmm. dig deeper now for them. Um, that was... Especially I, I have indie. to say, that was the great thing about um, albums and vinyl. That's why you want vinyl. You want vinyl for a lot of things. You can monetize it. We're going to get thing. to the analog-digital conversation <laughs> oh, in, well, in the but, third okay. hour. All right. I just wanted to talk. Make sure that your name is on there and your credits. Um. So yeah, uh, I, I got. Um, I I actually got hired by the in-house producer of Avatar Studios. His name is Jerry Barnes. He's a producer of Nell Rogers, um, and um, he's also the bassist of Chic. I got the chance because of that. I I ended up working with Nell Rogers, Roberta Flack, um, Shaka Khan, his circle. But so I thought I was gonna be set in New York, but um, I got a Facebook message from the mastering professor in Berklee College of Music asking if I'd be interested to apply f- for like this special position. Um, apparently, the mastering lab that the first independent mastering studio to open in 1967, Doug Sachs is needing a a right-hand man because his previous one flew to New Hampshire. And what they did was they did like an underground, like they sought out by word of mouth if they knew anyone. This is why it's so important to be a part of your community, right? Yeah. And also sharing what you're working on with all of each other. Yeah, word of mouth is is part of it. Powerful. Yeah. But so um, the colleagues, the circle of the mastering lab reached out to Berkeley College of Music. And um, so each um, audio engineering professor like put out their names, uh, put like recommended a, stu- uh, a recent graduate. So um, at that t- time I was like, is, is he for real? Um, I, I did know like the, the salary, blah, blah, blah. And he said, this is the kind of stuff that you shouldn't do. Um, like even hesitate, just apply. So I did, and I got hired. Um, I left my bags and everything in New York to work for this man, and it, I've never looked back. And that wasn't an easy decision for me too, because my um, employment um, as an international student was about to like run out. 
and I only had one month um, in terms of like legally being allowed to work. And Jerry Barnes was supposed to be my petitioner for my artist visa. And I had all my documents ready and when I got this job offer. So I had to scrap everything to redo my entire application under Doug Sachs. So the whole journey of, of being an international to, um, now I, I own a green card because it, like just that, that entire journey towards working um, to getting a green card is another story and it's hard. So it's even harder now, but I'm glad that I got to that point. But yeah, I'm a mastering engineer. Yeah. Yeah. Yay. Does anybody need to use the restroom? Is that, is because I, okay, is that, can we take a five minute break, Carrie? Well, I think you should probably open it up for questions. Should we open it up for questions? Can, it's nine, okay, yeah. All right, so um, the people who need to use the restroom, we will sneak off, um, and I will be one of them. Angel, please, sub. <laughs> Questions, right? Is yeah, that we, what we, we just go to questions from the audience, but you know. Sure. Um, this, I got you. This, go yeah. pee. Don't burst. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Hello, Angel M, sound girl of sorts. Um, I guess this is a really good opportunity because you have people from all disciplines. If you are curious about audio production, etc. Um, also, I know there's a lot of musical talent up here too. So, um, I guess. Just ask away if you have a question. Great. Um, as far as your individual journeys, how did you know whether you wanted to do mastering or recording? It looks like we have a microphone too there. Is it live? Oh, great. Okay, so we'll have you step up to those microphones. She just asked, how did you find your way? How did you know you wanted to be a mastering engineer or get into recording anything like that? Right, right, okay. Uh, audio post-production for commercials paid better. <laughs> the, so that Legit. was my choice. And, and they, they sought me out, and I thought, that sounds cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, flexibility is enormously important. Even though I started out in music, um, audio post became interesting because it could pay my rent. Um, and I could meet celebrities and like have stuff be on the TV and it was exciting, you know, and that I, d I didn't lose my interest in music because now I'm having music on TV and other things like that. But, you know, it took like 12 years to, <laughs> to yeah. get a, you know, circle back. And you discover things as you go. Exactly. So you, f you find what you really like. Because sometimes you think you're going to like something. I started as an artist and I hate it. So I didn't want to do that. I She's wanted to. Very, oh, very talented. Very nice. um, but I, I always wanted to be in production. That's where I ended up. But 25 years ago, I thought I was going to be a singer songwriter. So you really, ne you just have to pay attention to like what excites you, you know, what gets you going. So what got you going? Which, I mean, obviously you got, you walked into Leon Russell's place and was like, hey, well, okay, that was the start. But, um, but also I had. Um, I had some gigs. Uh, I ended up working for a producer uh, who was absolutely crazy. Um, he's the first one to say it, so uh, Mike Chapman. And um, there were just a lot of uh, weird business things going on. And um, I, I got, uh, I was working a lot, doing a, you know those long hideous hours. Um, and we we did like nine nine records in one year, uh, working you know from 10 a.m. to midnight every day, and uh, so um, I I kind of burned out and got cancer, to, and so I had to take a little cancer break for a few years, and um, so when I came back, I did not. Uh, I just couldn't see putting myself back into um, the music business again because that's kind of, you know, why I got sick. Mm -hmm. And um, actually, my doctor said, "Quit your job or die." So, wow. <laughs> so that kind of like, okay, um, yeah. So I got well, 
clearly. And um, yes, yeah, lucky me. And um, uh, so when I got back to it, uh, I wasn't sure how I could apply my skills, but what had happened was so many people had gone from the music business into post-production for the very reason that the money had fallen out of the music business and you could um, make a good living doing post. So um, I had a few connections and, and um, started at the bottom uh, all over again from being this big shot to uh, uh, what they said was, um, you may have been somebody in the music business, but here you're nothing. And I went, oh, okay, that's fine, uh, whatever. And uh, you know, <laughs> there were a lot of people in post who had gotten burned in the music business, so you couldn't say the M word. Um, uh, did you ever come across that? Mm -hmm. But uh, my first, uh, you know, so I started at $15. Well, they tried to pay me $15 an hour, and I just said, well, I can't live off that. And, and But um, the, the first shift I had doing post, foreign music and effects tracks for the entire Disney um, cartoon catalog, starting with Steamboat Willie. So I got to see every single Disney cartoon up until that time. But my shift was from 1 a.m. to 9 a.m., Yikes. which really stinks. Um, but, you know, uh, but the money built up and then I got off that icky shift and one thing led to another and yeah you finally start making money and you you find your niche and uh, but I have to say my passion was always music I was grateful that I could apply my skills doing other things um, but when I got the opportunity to produce foreign vocals I just said man you know, I got to make records again. <laughs> right. So I do it on my own terms, and it's not quite like the little woman who has a hobby, but I do a lot of other things audio-wise so I can afford to be in the music business and take those projects when they come along. Exactly. But that's my choice right now. Mm -hmm. But I do archiving. I do audio repair. I do uh, consulting for singer-songwriters, helping them set up their rooms. I speak. Um you know, mm -hmm. so it's all about just being really flexible. Yeah, well, yeah. it's it's because it's my passion, and this is what I want to do. So I figure out how to afford to do it. Mm -hmm. You have to kind of stay lateral. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that kind of influences the decisions you make <laughs> on what you want to go into. You do have to follow the money, definitely. At Hopefully, some not point. down the yeah. drain. <laughs> hey, Mac. Like yeah. you're, you primarily, would you say your discipline is in production, like vocal production and mixing? Oh, mix, uh, mixing. Yeah, vocal production and mixing mm -hmm. is, is my thing. But I, I, um, I fought for a very, very long time with myself. You know, on, honestly, up until about two months ago, I still was making beats. Um, but uh, my life just constantly over and over and over again told me that mixing was what I was supposed to do. Yep. And I tried to be like, no, I'm going to produce too. <laughs> but then it was like, nah, Allie. And here I am. Um, but real quick, this is slightly off topic, but I really just want to say this because she was talking about health and stuff, and I'm up here like glorifying like 16-hour days and shit. Um, and I've had my own health shit. And while we have to put in a lot of work and you have to go hard, I always get my sleep. Like when I'm ready to leave, I'm out. And everybody respects that because I got to get my sleep and I have to take care of myself. Am I going to the beach on Sunday? Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so so just always remember that you, you got to take care of yourself because you can't make music if you're dead. And uh, sorry, that was so somber, <laughs> Jen. <laughs> um, also, just to... <laughs> also, um, sometimes the, the, the niche or career path chooses you. Like, um, especially for, for young people wanting to pursue something. Like, s sometimes you grow up wanting to be a film director. But suddenly, the more you go, get deeper and deeper into this big um, industry, you realize that there's such a thing as um, just, like, very niche. Like, maybe cinematographer is even, like, very um, big. But there are a lot of, like, audio 
um sub sub paths yep. that um like the ordinary person is not aware of but is such a cool job like um for example um audio forensics is is freaking yeah. cool yeah. doing broadcast audio for NFL or the Olympics you don't really know about that until you like get deeper into the field so um just ha- keeping an open mind is is important like um I Growing up, I didn't know that I would become a vinyl cutter, mastering engineer. Like, I just wanted to be a sound engineer, and th- it, the path just took me here. Mm-hmm. And just keep an open mind. Mm-hmm. And, and don't be fixated on one thing, because might, you might just lose, like, um, the discovery of, like, other um, careers ahead of you. So keep an open mind and be flexible. Yes, yeah, so you can... It, uh, it'll make you more valuable um, to the industry and give you more value as an engineer. The more things that you can do, um, make sure you do them well if you say this is that thing I can do. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but there's so many things that are related that uh, that you can apply skills from one to another and then the nuances of that particular skill, well, you know, you'll pick those up. Um, but uh, the common thread is the audio part mm-hmm. and, um, and Pro Tools and... Um, or whatever DAW you're using. Um, If you're not using Pro Tools, I recommend you learn it because that's what people, you know, that will make you more valuable because that's more more pervasive throughout the industry. Uh, Globally, and think globally too. By all means, there's work all over the world. Mm-hmm. And uh, Mexico's so, popping right now, just for sound girls especially. Yeah, yeah so, um, yeah, uh, the world's gotten smaller and smaller. So, um, you know, many opportunities. And so much content being created these days for, you know, podcasts. They're, they're so huge. And, uh, and music, they've just now, um, you're able to license your music for um, when people do... Uh, put up little movies on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Uh, their personal movies. If they use some music on there, the the songwriters get uh, you know get paid for it. Yep. So that just happened. Woohoo! So um, <laughs> you know there is uh, so many areas you can go into, and um, uh, a lot of content is being created. So um, not just doing music, think of uh, all the other audio opportunities available to you. Forensics, really good. Acoustics. Yeah, archival is amazing. Yeah, archiving and, you know, fixing old uh, recordings that, you know, were done poorly. And, um, right, it gives you such a great opportunity to yeah. learn what not to do, and sometimes learning what not to do is the greatest teacher. Yeah, yeah, so... so um, there's a whole lot of areas to go into. And go into, um, you know, uh, sound for medicine. They're doing a lot of, um, uh, you know, um, mm-hmm. yeah, artificial Music intelligence therapy. and VR and all of that. Um, and audio is a part of it um, uh, for healing as well and for um, um, doing... Um, industrial films and doing sound and music for those and uh, uh, shoot there's just so many different areas uh, of conferences and doing uh, big conventions and things like that there's lots of money in that man so you look around you find your money gigs you see how that you see what the skills you have how you can apply that to those money gigs and you bring it there and that will always come back to the work that you want to do creatively because you'll be better at what you do You'll find opportunities, and then you'll meet people and start to move laterally. You have to be in this business ready at any moment to move laterally into something that you might not have ever expected you're going to do. And that's really how you make it in the new music business, because it's great to have a dream, and you should never lose that dream, but you have to move like this. Pivot or perish. Pivot or perish. Yes, ma'am. And it looks like our beautiful moderator is back. We're going to continue to ask questions. Stay. Stay. Okay, more questions. Let's open up the floor. Please come up to the mic if you don't mind. If you have a question, line up um, at the mic. Yeah, that'd be great. Line up at the mic if you have a question. Give us more urgency. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) I don't know how to do that. (laughs) So um, a friend of mine just retired, and she gave me her DAW and her um, Pro Tools for my garage. I'm a singer-songwriter. And what I don't have is I don't have a microphone. So I went to ASCAP 
uh, their expo thing, which was wonderful. And um, this microphone's $3,500, and that one's seven grand, and this one is specially for women's voices that are higher and la de doot. And I'm just like, look, I'm just beginning. I don't need a $7,000 mic, I don't think. So I was just wondering what you, what you think would be a nice, solid what? microphone that's good enough that uh, somebody could like make some nice sounds with it in a garage mm -hmm. um, and then post their music to the net. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's, what's your budget? I'm thinking somewhere, anywhere between maybe like 1500, 700, somewhere in the ballpark like that. Uh, TLM 103. Yeah. Nice, yeah. I couldn't make out what you just said. No <laughs> Neumann. N E U M A N N. T L M 103. T L M. And why do you like that? Because it's great. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's got I a really mean, balanced it's, response. It's really it's that's a better answer. Yeah, it's got a very balanced um, response. It sounds like a good condenser. For for your budget, I mean, it, it's a it's a really great microphone. Uh, I think it's going to be great on your vocals, um, and it's it's a step it's a step above uh, anything that's below it. Mm -hmm. So it'll give you a really professional sound. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I would uh, suggest is like going to uh, Westlake Pro or, mm -hmm. or Guitar, Guitar Center Pro, tell them what your budget is and audition microphones because um, uh, the best, mi what is the best microphone to use on something? Whatever sounds good. Yeah, the yeah. one that sounds the, that sounds the best. Good. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what, you know, whatever the characteristics are in your voice, um, you know, each one of these microphones has a slightly different uh, EQ to them and a quality to them. And um, find out which is the best mic for you within your budget. And the, they're willing to help you there. Or if you can take a, a pal with you who has some experience, um, you know, and... Uh, you can hear yourself maybe record a little bit and play it back and uh, but but there are, that that's a fantastic microphone mm -hmm. and, and there are some others too yeah. um, it just depends on what sound, sounds best on your voice cool thank you <laughs> highly recommend Westlake Pro they do let you play around a lot of those guys are great and with that budget they'll definitely work with you so um, I just wanted to ask um, if you're someone who, hold on, I heard my question. <laughs> okay. Okay, so um, wh how do you get your foot in the door if you think you don't have enough skills to, to qualify for certain positions, like as an intern, or if, like, I just don't understand. That's what I'm trying to understand, because I feel like I don't have enough skills, even though I'm learning and I learn pretty quick, but it just feels like I don't feel qualified for certain jobs. You'll, you'll never be, you'll learn what mm. they want you to do. Yeah. So it's a confidence thing, not a what you know thing. Oh, okay, cool. 100%. So, so I haven't been ready for 100% of the opportunities <laughs> I've taken. You just say yes and figure it out. Yeah, exactly, Always. that's true. And the thing is, every studio has a different way of doing mm. things, and they want you to learn their way. Exactly. Yeah. And so, um, you know, everybody needs to know that because you don't go into a studio and say, oh, well, I, I do it this way. And they say, I don't care. <laughs> you know, this is how we do it here. And yes, we're still using Pro Tools 9, mm -hmm. you know, 9.7, because all my plugins work for that. And see that tower over there on, you know, the, yeah. Um, yeah. But, um, Yep. <laughs> no, never. That's why confidence confidence is mandatory. And show them you want yes. it. It's it's really show up wanting it because I when I went to, I worked at Interscope for three years in that mm. studio and I did I did not have everyone I worked with was a Berkeley graduate had yeah. papers I'm self taught I hadn't even really worked on Pro Tools a little bit mm. of Logic mm. I just said look I want this it's what I want to do it's mm. what I know I'm going to do. I will work hard. I will learn whatever I need to do. I'll put in hours off-site to learn more if you just tell me what to learn. And if you go in with that attitude of like confident that you want to do it and passionate about showing up, you're going to get hired. 
Generally, yeah. if they if if you're right for the culture and if they can, it's a very competitive town. Obviously, Los mm-hmm. Angeles. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, yeah. so I'll just tell you a story really quick mm-hmm. about um, you know. So when I came out here, you know, the first few recording sessions I did, like you know, I went home and was just like, <laughs> <laughs> shit. You know, what did I do? Mm-hmm. Um, but like this the recording studio. Um, I, I got brought in by somebody, you know, and I met the owner and I'm talking to him and, and I just kind of got some, like, he was like, yeah, we're going to, you know, have this interview, you know, and then you're going to show me your template. And I was like, oh, my template. Yeah, I'll bring in my template. I didn't have a template. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I definitely did not have one that was ready for L.A., but I was in the studio and he was, um, you know, doing a session. So I walked over and I was like, oh. Cool, yeah, nice template over there. So I went home and I made his template, <laughs> and uh, and I made it a little different. You know, I used like the plugins that I like to use, and I brought it in and I showed it to him. He was like, "Oh man, this is great. This looks really similar to mine." And I was like, "What a coincidence! <laughs> Whoa, what a coincidence!" <laughs> you know, <laughs> and uh, for real, like, and so yeah. he never knew. He to this day he doesn't know that I didn't have a template that looked like that. That's you awesome. know what I mean? And I never used one that I always started from scratch until then. <laughs> You know, and then every time, whenever I was in anywhere at, at this spot or any other spots, I was always watching these other engineers. You know, the first time I did a stadium show, mm-hmm. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. <laughs> so I told, the, I told the tech, I was like, hey, man, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and I asked him to help me, and he helped me. And then, you know, as far as anybody on that tour knew, I had done hundreds of stadiums. Mm -hmm. That's a great point about being transparent about what you don't know. They'll definitely appreciate that more than you acting like you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, exactly. Say, uh, if somebody asks you to do something and you haven't done it before, say, um, I don't know how to do that, but I can, you know. I'll try. Yeah, (laughs) but I'll learn. Or, you know, just show me and I'll get it. Make sure you don't ask that question twice about that same thing, you know. And uh, one thing I want to say, too, about students, because I I taught for a long time as well. Um, If you're enrolled in a a recording school, wherever it is, whether it's MI or anywhere else, uh, utilize that studio time anytime you've got as much as you possibly can, because once you're out of here, it's done. You don't have that time to practice or anything like that. And I was just amazed at how many students didn't use the time that was available to them. You'd be walking around and there'd be empty studios and you're just going, but there would be those students who are always in the studio and, you know, they get rack up more hours than anybody else. They'd win like a award or something for the most studio hours. But And so guess what, you know, they were a lot more prepared because it's an acquired skill. And yeah, I, oh man, you know, <laughs> even though I'd done all that stuff at Leanne Russell's house with Roger Lynn, um, when I got to the village, I was a whole different place and whole, you know, a lot of different equipment and all of that and, and the real deal. And um, man, I, I almost got fired a few times. <laughs> yeah, you're, yep. you're, you're, you're gonna mess up. You're gonna mess up bad. Yeah. Learn how but to like take I the said, L. You're going to wake up the next day and you're going to show up again. Like, just show up. And also, just to add to that, um, I can relate. Like, imposter syndrome is real. You always feel that you don't know enough and that you're not good enough. But you'd be surprised by how much you know more than than the, the... folks who are like bragging about like how they know mm. this and that plugin and, and just trust yourself that you're doing the best that you can imposter syndrome is real and it's a challenge mm. it's like an internal like struggle to always just fight that so it's a very very great point Thank and you. i think with a lot of women in audio especially yeah, i'm telling you for you and your confidence mm. issues there's like 20 dudes who know way less than you who are willing to bullshit oh, their yeah, way that's into the, the room because i know, you know? i know <laughs> exactly fight that <laughs> yeah <laughs> thank you guys so show much. up you got it for sure and reach out to us yeah you know what i mean we're resources for you mm-hmm. cool uh so i was just wondering do you guys think it's better to to like focus my time on getting like an internship or something like that at the studio and trying to work my way up 
or focusing on getting like other gigs or like whatever random thing you can find because I've heard people say that like you know what big do you students, do though what, uh, what are you? mostly like trying to get into recording and mixing I just graduated from the recording school down the street uh, so I'm trying to like get in and get started um, so which is more like which should I be focusing more on because I've heard people say that like you can't get in unless you're in a big studio and I've heard people say that big studios are dead so like which is smarter in your opinion well I think uh, both of them are a good approach it depends I know that I'm sorry that's not very definitive however an internship what what you get from a, a proper internship is um, the whole point of the internship is that they are supposed to um, they utilize you yet they're supposed to give back and teach you so you are you are supposed to be if you get an internship through your school or you're just looking to get an internship on your own. But any kind of internship, uh, they will pay you in knowledge, and that's what they're supposed to do. So make sure that the internship is doing that um, mm -hmm. and that you get in there. And if, if they're just using you to clean the toilets and the, the kitchen and make coffee, and then uh, what I suggest is getting an internship that uh, – instead of three or four hours in a day, um, like if you can only intern like one or two days a week, make sure it's a 12 hour day because then you get all your chores done and then you can hang and then you, uh, you're you around enough to where you become familiar and you can do develop relationships with the staff as well as the clientele. You, you learn industry savvy too. It, that I think learning how things work is probably more important than just getting a job. I, I think actually an internship is a better, that's how I got my job. And I can't even honestly imagine freelancing. I mean, I've been freelancing for 12 years now, but I don't think I, I don't know how I would do that without real, you know, big studio experience or at least learning from somebody who, or an organization or something, you know, where they're doing things in the industry because you learn how how the moving parts work and it's way different than you could ever have possibly imagined. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm going to go on a, a different approach there because I never did an internship. I legit was just like, I'm going to get a job. And I <laughs> didn't, and I don't, don't get me wrong, like, get a mentor, man. Like... Mentoring Mentor is, is so important, valuable. and I wish I had better mentors in the beginning of my career, and that's why I make a real effort to make sure I'm mentoring people now, um, because it's so important. Um, oh, and I had something else to say, <laughs> but um, well, well, Ali tries to figure it out. Um, um, <laughs> it's also important that to to understand that internship isn't like the end all be all, like. Um, I did an internship, of course, but the thing that really gets you the next job isn't like the the bragging right that you work at, that you intern at the village, that you intern at Avatar. That's not how I got my gigs. I, I got more work because I did. Um, I worked with artists. I, I, I recorded um, people. I mixed um, for them. And since you're already in, in recording school, um, you should utilize what you've learned and record and mix as many artists as possible because it's, again, what I'm saying about independent artists, they're the ones that are more like in touch with like social media and promotion and word of mouth. So if they find um, an engineer that they really dug and they're really happy with, they're gonna like really um, v um, vouch for you. So internship um, gives you like um, industry um, just experience and, and, and just just all the decorum of that. But um, your your legacy as a mixer and recording engineer is from the people that you work with, the actual artists. So that's just my. How are you? Yeah. After you. You I have something to say too, but you go first. Okay, yeah, I don't want to lose yeah, it again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I got it. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> so yeah, kind of going off of what what Jet said as well as like you know yeah you got to do a lot of free work. I've done so much free work. I'm probably gonna do free work again. Mm -hmm. um, you know because you have to figure out 
what's more helpful because if I do this for free, this guy is going to tell this guy who's going to give me twice as much as what I probably could have got from him. Um, but what I was really going to say is whatever situation that you're in, being helpful mm -hmm. to the people around you is the most important thing because if you are helpful to them, they think about you. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. like they're like, man, who can get this done for me? Oh, sorry, I don't know your name. Yeah. But, <laughs> um, you know, and then they're going to call you. You know, like even uh, this this intern that works for us right now, you know, we're always like, Dom! And he's like, I'm here, guys, I'm here, what do you need? And we're like, just nothing, just kidding. We wanted to see what your, your reaction time was. We like it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, but now he, he's part of the team, you know, and more opportunities are going to come his way because he's always ready to be helpful to us. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Along with that, what she's uh, actually saying too is that be an asset, not a liability. Um, be that person that people want to have in the session because you bring something to it. Um, because it is about who you know and it's about being able, it's about your social skills. And the uh, good thing about an internship is it's an opportunity for you to demonstrate um, your work ethic, your hygiene, your social skills, um, uh, being willing to do that job that nobody else wants to do makes you valuable. Uh, that is one of the best things that somebody taught me early on. Be that person. <laughs> Her whole career, Eric. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, you can be really proficient with all your mic techniques and all your plugins and all, you know, your DAWs and all of that. But if nobody wants to be in the same room with you for more than five minutes, it's not going to matter. You have to get along well. You have to be a team player. And, um, you know, it, in the beginning, yeah, just be helpful. Um, because if it's 10 o'clock at night and I know I'm going to 4 in the morning and I can't leave the console and I need that cup of coffee, all I have to do is look at that intern with the, you know, point, point at the cup and there's this one guy, he would bring me my perfect cup of coffee and my favorite mug uh, and with a, just the right color and, you know, 1% <laughs> milk and he was the most important in, person in the room at that time because... Uh, I needed that, yep. and I couldn't do it. I couldn't stop everything. And say, hey, you know, I'm gonna go get some, make some coffee. You want some coffee? You want some? Yeah. That's not my job. I can't do that because I have to make sure that that client is happy in the sessions going on. So every one of those um, positions in the studio is absolutely valuable because it, you're going into a service organization. You're providing a service. It's like a uh, one studio that I work at, Woodshed, out in Malibu, um, you know, he, uh, the owner of Richard Gibbs, he says he, he gets uh, students, uh, you know, graduates and interns coming in, and he has the, the concierge from the um, Beverly Hills Hotel come in and teach them how it, it's a concierge service, how mm -hmm. to provide for your, your clients. Because they have choices. They can go anywhere. So yes, you have to be good at what you do, but also you have to be that person people want to be around. And, and you have to read their minds. Sorry, mm -hmm. you have to be three steps ahead. But the more you do it, the, the anticipation. If you listen, and they're talking about what they want to do, well, I'm going to do some vocals now, and then we'll do some backgrounds. If you have time, I'll do the piano. Get in there and mic that piano. Find, you know, ask the engineer what, if you don't know what mics they want to use, find out and get that ready so in case the guitar part isn't working out or the vocal comes out really fast, boom, they can go right to the piano and it's ready. Yep. You made a great point about the coffee thing too. And you don't want to get trapped being the coffee maker. Um, but Jimmy Iovine, one thing I learned when I was at Interscope is Jimmy Iovine was started out a very crap engineer. I'm sorry to say such a thing, but it's true. Um, he made a cup of coffee for John Lennon and he made pals with John Lennon. And that's basically what got him in the room. Um, I had a similar experience where I had dental floss and Don was, was looking for dental floss. And that, that got me, uh, you know, six weeks of being able to shadow inside of the room. So pack your bag full of everything and just be prepared to anticipate any need at any time and that will give you way more than you know your $50,000 $100,000 education 
ultimately, because it is a social business for sure. I have to just step in here and say, learn how to fix things too, because that worked for me. We do Soldering. need- Soldering. Text. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. If you can, uh, I remember there was a tracking date over at East West, or, no, uh, an orchestra was coming in last minute because they were supposed to be at some other studio and that had gone down. And so at like 10 o'clock on a Friday night, um, there was a, a party going on actually. And uh, suddenly they had to set up for 86 musicians yeah. in studio one. And they had um, 80 sets of headphones for them and six were broken. And this one intern went in and fixed those other headphones, and guess who was the star of that show? Yeah. Cool. Soldering. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Great. All right. Time for these two. Come on up. Uh, hi, my name is Aishwarya. I think I have two very long questions I need to ask. I think my first question will be to Ali. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about vocal production, as in how do you transition from becoming, you know, you start off as a recording mixing engineer, and then I guess vocal production is a little bit more, you know, um, like a niche, you know, like you get into it. So maybe if you can give me an insight of how do you do vocal production and, you know, what your presets are and, you know, your chain, how do you go about with it? You want my chain? <laughs> Just like <laughs> she came in trying to snatch your chain. Yeah. <laughs> My settings, man. Yeah. That's gonna be seventy-five dollars. We have. Oh, I got, we have you, eight. I got you. Just okay. okay. Eric is like, stop making jokes, Sally. Um, okay, so. Uh, and please talk to me after. I'm happy, honestly, to share my template so with you. you. No problem. Um, basically, you know, when you start out as a recording engineer, you really have to like, you have to read the room. You know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of times where you better not say anything and you're just pressing the number three. And that's never what I wanted, but I'm in the room. Uh, and then you just, it's all about, like, when I'm recording, you know, whoever's in the booth, I don't care if there are 20, 30 other people in the room, whatever is happening is between me and them. And I have to get out um, what, what they need to put down on. I have to get their emotions out of them. They have to trust me. So however I get them to trust me, whether it's with a little joke here or whatever, to a point, like, you know, depending on who it is, in 40 minutes, I can be stopping them in the middle of the take and saying, nah, you gotta do that again, because I've gained their trust. And I know if I don't feel it, it's not the take, and there's no point in me going another 30 seconds down this road. Um, so yeah, it's really just about reading the room um, and taking your time, and you know, I've been in a lot of different sessions. I've seen a lot of different artists and a lot of different genres. Um, but it's really about catering to them. And even though I'm stopping them in the middle of the track, they trust that I'm doing it because I care about what they're doing. Okay. You know, so. You're inspiring and capturing. Yep. Inspiring Lit. and yeah. capturing. <laughs> <That's what you're laughs> yeah, inspire. Oh, I get it. I get yeah, it. Yes, yeah, they're inspiring yeah. and capturing. You're you know, inspiring them to right. Even when they have a bad take, you're like, no, nah, you're doing great, man. You can do this. You got this. You got this. Let's go. Mm -hmm. You know, just encouraging them, and that's that's it. Yeah. Okay, but and what? Um, like in what step of the recording process does vocal producer come in? You know, like when you're recording, you're recording, you go with the drums, the bass, and you know, like vocals are usually kept at the last. Or is it when, you know, the clients come to you with sole production, with sole intent of... Well, doing... I'm really mostly doing vocal recording. Right. I'm really not doing like very, I'm, I'm, man, I haven't done drums in years for real. Right. Um, you know, so I'm just doing so much pop and hip hop, like the right. tracks are pretty much pre-made. I mean, I'll record a guitar and stuff here and there, but I yeah. See. Okay, all right. Um, and I thank you for that. Um, and my next question is with credits. I'm so glad Erica got that up. Um, I have been an international student and I was working as an um, intern in um, one of the studios and I did a lot of work, but, and my name is on the input list, but I guess uh, after my internship was done, and I asked about the credits. Um, I was pretty much told that it depends upon um, the artist when they put it up on all credits. So I'm basically, I have done- You mean uh, all music? Um, all all music. credit music. Yeah, it's, yeah, all, it's, music. yeah all, all music. That's the site we have our list on. Um, I just don't know how to basic, and they said that they didn't know about how to get your name like as an assistant engineer on the all music of credit. Is there any advice you can give us to how I could um, f approach this? Because 
Is this for um, a visa situation? No, I mean, no. It's At this point, it's just a matter of building my portfolio because I've done a bunch of work. I just don't have any... I, I don't have any... Don't don't worry about like make having your name on the liner notes or, or on all music because all music is is not accurate and it's not 100% accurate and it's not even it's not even 50% complete um like for example I, one of my main credits um for the composer of Brokeback Mountain um my name was credited as Jeff Galindo <laughs> on all music and Jeff Galindo is a trombone player <laughs> Oh. He's a well-known. So I'm all I'm saying is, don't even worry about like bugging them about. Hey, it should be on like the liner notes. It's on the CD. It's on like Discogs or All Music. You putting your name, uh, you putting that credit on your website that you worked on so and so big names because you knew you did, and they could vouch for that. That's it's fair game. Put it on your on on your discography or your, or your portfolio um no one like no um major like anyone who was involved in that production process no one would like run after you to like hey take that down right yeah yeah like um and be honest about um if people ask you about like the nature of the work that you did that that you um like you helped um record the the vocals or you just did some quick edits or you like prepared the session i mean that's on you when when they ask i think it's a fair game you did your part you deserve that credit yep. so is it but it's not if it, it's not um if i'm not violating anything if i'm just putting that on my resume because yeah. um, i've only worked as an assistant engineer so i do not have like mixing credits it's not coming yeah. on the album you know it's I mean, something you're not, that i'm working yeah. for myself you're not going to say that you're the mix engineer right you're um you're like um you're the assistant engineer right. like the 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 100% like detailed liner note proof of like the the role that you played in there comes into play if it's like visa situation or if you want to um take home a freaking grammy certificate like right. si si situations like that suddenly like um being an assistant doesn't make you qualified to take home the grammy um only like the main players um are qualified um yeah even like getting home like if if something you've worked on gets a grammy nomination you get you get um, a certificate for that. But right. yeah, so credit is fair game. I encourage you to do that. Okay, Excellent. and how would you say about uh, like... We, we have, we're running out You're of time. You're welcome to like so talk we later. Can, okay, yep. okay. Well, yep. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know it's getting late, so I'll just keep it real quick. So I'm kind of on the other end of the spectrum here. Um, I've been in a radio uh, technician, audio engineer for NPR for 24 years. I'm also um, a musician and I play um, guitar. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> and I also, you know, have a doll at home. I have Pro Tools, and I've, on my own dime, uh, been uh, getting certified on it. And um, and so my question is, I'm thinking about retiring from the full-time gig because I'm finding that when I go home and try to work on my music, when I've been sitting in front of a computer all day at work and, and my ears are kind of fried from all the crazy talk that you know comes through and, um, and the news, um, <laughs> I just can't get myself to really sit down and do that very well. I'm just burned out. So I'm thinking about retiring and trying to transition into some work like pre-production, post-production, anything. I just kind of want to, my creative juices have dried up at NPR, believe it or not, because when I first started the gig, we they, they used to send us everywhere, and I was doing sound out in, in nature, and I was going to the White House, and I was dealing with all these things that back in D.C., and then out here, it was, you know, all the, you know, whoever you see in L.A., you know, movie stars, shit like that. So, um, and then they took it away from us, because they felt the interns and the producers were better and it was cheaper because they would send a technician out, myself or, you know, and a producer and a reporter and it was like getting really expensive. So, um, the, and the creative mixing stuff, they gave that all away to the producers. So I'm like going crazy uh, in so many ways with um, my creativity not being stimulated. I mean, I love my job in many ways, but I'm like not doing anything that I really want to do. So I'm thinking about transitioning and, uh, you know, retiring and then trying to get a job in the industry. I mean, entry level, whatever it is, you know, I mean, you know, I, I have a lot of skills, so I don't think it would be entry level, but I just want to know what your, what your advice is to, for me to kind of transition so I can, I'll take a pay cut. That's okay. 
I mean, I don't want to. Sure. That's okay, but I will regardless. I mean, if, 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 you know, eventually, you know, eventually, I hope you know that would change. But I also write songs, and I have a band, and uh, you know, I'm very active. In uh, yeah, I feel like I'm just kind of need to take that next step. It's very scary to leave the job. So, thoughts, anybody? That's really hard because this is definitely the most competitive time ever in the history of engineer, I use different apps for this and that. And it used to be like, there are six people in your area competing for jobs. And like yesterday it was like, there are 245 people. I'm not kidding. Like it's multiplied by like exponentially. Yeah. So if you did maybe do something part time, the, the thing is learning something new is draining too. Yeah. You know, so you're, the creative thing isn't gonna like, repopulate on its own, you know? Like, I, I wonder if, if there's a way, because full-time employment is, like, so great. Um, only I only say this because I've been d doing this in the peaks and valleys of working for yourself for a long time now, like mm -hmm. over 10 years. Mm -hmm. And you'll hit places where it's like, this is, impo this is impossible. Mm -hmm. um, any kind of steady income is a really great, uh, right now, if there's a way to maybe approach your job differently or maybe just not care. I mean, this sounds terrible, but like, just check out. Like, just be like, wow, this is lame. I'm just going to go. And then when I get home, I'm going to do the fun stuff or like look forward to it or maybe just not, not you know, n not invest a, a lot of energy in the, I, I don't know. I mean. Well, it, I want to do, I want to do sync. I want to get my songs. Uh, I w Kathy Hill, are you familiar with her? Yeah. You know, I've been kind of following her. She has yeah. a lot of music uh, for TV and radio. Yeah. That's, that's my goal, it, one of my goals. And I know that's something you do. And it'd be, yeah. Uh, it, you know, it's kind of in my dream, but I see how hard it is it's to do it with a full-time job. It's really... Let alone just... Really, 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 really... A lot of details, really a lot of follow-up. Really competitive. And, yeah, I know. And it's really, really, really hard to meet the people that can do something for you, too. Yeah. Uh, I would suggest possibly uh, applying some of the skills that you're using in your um, present yeah. job now, um, getting a job in a post-production facility or uh, whatever area that you are inspired to go into to learn um, whatever it is that you want to learn. Um, get your foot in the door. Yeah with the skills that you have so that you are useful to them yeah, and you are I, valuable to them and um, let them know that that's what you want to do. Yeah. And um, I know in the Foley world, that's it's really hard to get into doing Foley. For ex I'm just giving an example, but uh, yeah. the way you get in is, you know, take that lower job or take yeah. a different job and then, you know, apprentice with a Foley artist or whatever and okay. you can edge your way into it eventually if you're any good at it. The, sure. Another uh, alternate thing that I, I've actually done before is actually get a, a straight job yeah. that has nothing to do with audio mm -hmm. and like work nine to five or like really easy hours. Mm -hmm. It's consistent and then all the other time is creative. So you essentially have two hour, two jobs, but th that's, that's one of the things also I've done where I don't have to think about anything audio related. I can just go do the thing and then do the music and all the other things on the weekend or after you get home at five. That's like, you know, that, that's when Allie's just getting started. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I, so yeah, I appreciate idea. that. I, I do. I, but I think I really want to kind of transition out so I can not work full time and so one of the so one thing I want to just mention is that we're actually five minutes over. Sorry yeah. to cut you off. Thank you, by the way. I appreciate it. Want to thank it. the panelists, but don't go too far. What I want to say is, come find us outside sure. after, and um, we can chat more. Mm -hmm. And same goes for everybody else. I, we just want to be mindful of the facility. It is now ten o'clock. So can I just you, say one thing? Yeah, absolutely. It's just like one sentence. I just want you guys to know. You can fucking do it. Yeah. So thank you, everyone. Thanks up. And thank, thank you, you all, all for, for being here. Thank yeah. you. It means a lot to us. Okay, good night. Way to wrap it up, Erica. Thank you for the sub.
Ladies.